We left off talking about uh, early curtain wall development in the post-war era, and we looked at a number of high-rise buildings that used steel and glass uh, to clad buildings in these very lightweight, uh, non-structural skins. Steel and glass curtain walls had a short, brief uh, life, and they were quickly superseded by uh, a metal that had much more, um, a much more flexible, much more agile uh, application to curtain walls. And that's the material that we typically use today in building cladding, uh, aluminum. Why aluminum instead of steel, uh, we'll get into, but why not aluminum uh, to begin with? Uh, it's a material that today is a normal part of our building palette, especially when it comes to building cladding. Um, and yet it, it wasn't really until the, the mid uh, to late 1950s. Um, the uh, metal was discovered uh, in 1807, uh, but refining it from the ore that it naturally occurs in, bauxite, uh, proved to be really, really difficult, very energy intensive, uh, and thus, particularly in the 19th century, uh, very, very expensive. It is a really a super material. It has nearly the strength of steel, uh, but is more ductile than steel, uh, and it's corrosion resistant. So it has this uh, unique combination of very light, very workable, and relatively strong, uh, in addition to being durable. It also conducts heat very well, um, which is very good if you're uh, making a pot or a pan. And in fact, uh, aluminum's first real uh, large scale application was for a cookware in the late 19th century. If you're making building cladding, though, it's an inherent problem, right? You would like material that doesn't conduct heat so well, uh, that helps to insulate the interiors uh, of your building uh, from the outside. So aluminum has all of these advantages. It has this one very distinct uh, drawback. The other drawback, its expense, was largely solved uh, during the course of World War II. It became a, a really strategic commodity because its lightweight and strength were really critical for aircraft production. And so there was a race to both uh, secure bauxite mines, which occur in the, in the Western Hemisphere, mostly in the, in the Caribbean, uh, but also to build factories. And in fact, the, the Reynolds Company, which is now, uh, we think of as one of the major aluminum suppliers in the world, they were originally the cigarette factory Reynolds. They had a small aluminum production plant that turned out foil for cigarette packages. The, the government, the Department of Defense, went to them in the early days of World War, I, of World War II uh, and asked them to ramp that up so that they could produce aluminum in quantities that the, the factories that we saw uh, in the lecture on, on building and, and power uh, could use to, to make aircraft uh, in particular. The uh, scaling up the capacity also brought with it advancements in uh, fabrication technology. So we'll go through some of these in a minute, but uh, you can get uh, aluminum not only in kind of chunks and ingots, but you can get it in very, very thin sheets. You can get it in foils, just like the original uh, cigarette uh, packet wrappers, uh, and you can get them in extrusions. And we'll talk about that in particular because extrusion offers advantages over the rolling process in steel uh, that we're used to seeing uh, in that material. It is an incredibly energy intensive, incredibly carbon intensive material. Uh, refining it requires an enormous amount of electricity uh, and uh, where the electricity is and where the bauxite is, uh, as you would imagine, Murphy's Law uh, says that they won't match up. So while the mines are largely these days in Jamaica, uh, aluminum tends to be refined uh, in places that have access to good hydroelectric power. So today that's in Quebec and the Pacific Northwest. Um, that is why the equitable building that we looked at briefly, the Pietro Belusky office building in Portland, that is why that building uh, was able to use an aluminum uh, skin because it was very close to the aluminum refining uh, plants that relied on hydroelectric power uh, on the Columbia River. Just to sort of uh, drive the point home, uh, you can see from these that uh, aluminum has competitive compressive and tensile strength with steel. Um, but if we look at a, a factor that, that we haven't uh, looked at so much, which is hardness, a, a relative measure of of workability related to ductility, which we've seen before. Um, aluminum is much softer 
uh, and therefore much, much easier to work. And in particular, not only is it easier to cut and to drill, but it's easier to form into much more precise uh, sections or extrusions. Uh, it can be rolled. So here you see a cold aluminum ingot being rolled through presses, very much like steel is rolled, but aluminum only needs to be warmed up. It doesn't need to be heated to red hot. And so as you can see, um, these workers do not have any of the protective gear that you would expect from workers handling uh, hot steel uh, in a rolling process. So we could get all the usual I-beams, channels, uh, T-shapes, uh, things like that out of, out of rolling. But what we typically use instead is a process called extrusion. And this takes advantage of the ductility or of the softness of aluminum uh, to, to create much finer, much more uh, detailed shapes. In extrusion, uh, what happens, you see on the, the diagram on the left, uh, a billet of uh, aluminum is put into a, a hardened steel container. Uh, there is a die that is uh, attached to the front of the container and literally the ingot is pressed through the die uh, to create uh, the shapes, some of which you see there uh, on the right. Uh, aluminum being relatively soft, it can squeeze through these dies uh, almost like a fluid uh, and therefore it retains the shape of the die after it, it comes out. Um, if as a kid you ever played with a, a Play-Doh Fun Factory, this is the extrusion process. You put the, the, the Play-Doh in the, in the Fun Factory, you put a die that has a star shape or a smiley face or whatever, you press the lever down and it pushes the Play-Doh through the, the, the die and gives you roughly the, the shape that you want. <clears throat> to take the analogy one step further, if you do it with brand new Play-Doh, you may remember as a kid, you get a, a very, very clean shape. If you do it with old, kind of dried out Play-Doh, uh, you get a very, very rough shape. And that's the difference effectively between aluminum uh, and steel. Aluminum behaves like fresh Play-Doh, keeps, as you can see, the sharp edges and things from the, from the extrusion die. Steel gets caught on the die because it's not as ductile and you end up with a much, much rougher surface. You can extrude steel, but you don't get the, the precision or the smooth surface that you do uh, with aluminum. On the left, this is a typical aluminum extrusion today, and you can see that for cladding, it's an ideal metal because out of the extrusion, you can get all of these uh, refinements to the shape that allow the aluminum to work with, for instance, neoprene seals, right? Or uh, that, that allow them to hook together in ways that let you thermally separate the inside part of a mullion from the outside part of a mullion. You can also uh, extrude slots that provide uh, spaces for screws so that you can screw pieces uh, of the mullion together. On the right, you see early publicity uh, from, uh, from Reynolds Aluminum, in fact, um, showing how the extrusion process can make uh, much more precise shapes, much more complicated shapes than typical fabrication processes in steel uh, can make. And this is really aluminum's kind of great uh, advantage that you can, if you design the extrusion right, and you have to be a little bit careful, you have to balance it out so that the, the material flows through the die correctly. You can only have kind of a minimum thickness of, of pieces, but it's much, much thinner typically than, than steel allows. But so long as you follow those rules, almost anything is possible. And aluminum fabricators uh, got very good very quickly at breaking up shapes into extrudable sections that they could manufacture uh, relatively uh, inexpensively. You can also, because aluminum is ductile, you can stretch form it. You can take sheets of aluminum and you can not only break shake them, bend them basically as you can with steel, uh, but you can stretch them around a, a die as you see the, the machines doing on the left in a contemporary uh, um, uh, application. On the right, something from the 1950s, where you're literally gripping the edges of a, of a thin sheet of aluminum stretching it around a, a mold or a mandrel. Uh, and because you're stretching the aluminum uh, past its elastic limit, it behaves plastically, it stretches permanently, uh, and you get a shape with a permanent deformation. Um, that process applies not only to stretching, but also to stamping. And as we'll see, uh, fit cladding in the 1950s takes advantage of this, uh, in addition to extrusion to create solid panels uh, that, that uh, complement the glazing that are the, the typical panels that we think of uh, when we think of curtain walls. 
So putting all of this together as a system, the improvements in glass that have to do with manufacturing and insulated glazing, the improvements in uh, uh, the, the metal that holds them going from steel and wood uh, to aluminum, uh, all of this basically takes the fabrication off of the job site and puts it into factories. This means that you can telescope the production time, you can manufacture the cladding elements while the building structure is being built. You can make them in laboratory conditions, right? Factory conditions where you're controlling uh, the environment around you. You're not worried about whether the mortar and brick is gonna set or whether the bricks are damp when you're laying them. You're not worried about timing a huge labor force on the job site to show up uh, exactly when. Uh, these advantages are, are shown in a, in a book that came out in 1958. Uh, the, the contemporary curtain wall that made the argument that this was uh, a way not only to make buildings appear more modern, uh, but also to save an awful lot of time and money on the job site. And the fundamental argument is there on the left, that uh, when you prefabricate uh, large elements of a curtain wall, you can simply place, you can simply bolt them to the building, uh, and instead of 500 units, right, 498 bricks and two windows, um, you just have one unit, right? And so that saves you the time of maneuvering all of that brick, bringing it all the way up to whatever floor you're on, but also saves you the time of laying the brick, right? All you're doing is bolting uh, the panel uh, onto, the, onto the building. On the right, interestingly enough, this is another illustration from the same book. And you see that even as late as 1958, uh, cladding engineers are assuming that these upstand walls are still going to be part of the, the building cladding. So you get buildings that tend to have large spandrel panels or large sill panels that are solid and then windows above it that obviously are, are, are glass. And you can see too that uh, this diagram is showing that you need some way to get from the building structure, very often poured in place concrete that has a, a tolerance of a quarter inch or a half inch or maybe even more. You need a, a substructure that allows you to go from the very imprecise uh, concrete slab or concrete column or girder out to the very precise extruded aluminum and glass. And so there's a whole library of connections that develops that allows those panels to be placed and then adjusted in height, in depth, uh, and, and in a position on the, on the building, right? So three axis connections that let you put the panel uh, in place just about perfectly. At the same time, there is the thermal uh, issue, uh, the, 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 the need to keep the exterior of the curtain wall, at least in hot and cold climates, thermally separated from the, the interior. And this takes a while to solve. Uh, it only comes about with uh, better neoprene seals, better sort of plastic connections that break the mullions into two and that, that give you a sort of um, exterior element and an interior element that allow you to insulate uh, the building from, from the exterior environment. And in this first generation of curtain walls, you see all kinds of uh, applications. Um, these, this is another set of pages from that same book, 1958. Um, and you see architects playing around with the need for both a, a, a solid sill and a, a glazed vision panel. Uh, and using materials like glass and aluminum, obviously, uh, but also stone to create architectural interest, right? Any material that you can uh, shave into a relatively thin panel uh, is kind of game. And so you see this kind of language emerging of veneered materials, sometimes limestone, sometimes marble, in conjunction with, uh, with the glazing. If you look at these, you can see that both have uh, ways of adjusting the position of the, the curtain wall panels. So the limestone panel on the right um, has uh, eye bolts that allow it to move in and out, up and down, left and right. And similarly, the, the hotel uh, cladding on the left uh, has connections at the slabs that let you adjust uh, where, that, where that, um, that curtain wall panel is, is going to be. Um, where it says formed panel on the left, that is typically a, a metal, a stamped metal a panel, sometimes of steel, but more commonly of aluminum. In particular, after Alcoa, uh, the aluminum company of America, rival company to Reynolds, uh, builds its own headquarters in Pittsburgh, 
1953. And as you might expect, Alcoa, looking for markets to, to sell its, uh, its material, uses its headquarters as a demonstration project. Um, almost everything that could be aluminum in this building is aluminum. Uh, so that includes on the interior ceiling panels, uh, do door handles, switches, even the wiring in the building was originally uh, aluminum, a sort of ill-fated uh, effort to overtake copper. Where Alcoa found its most successful market, though, was in the building exterior. And as you can see, uh, the, the Alcoa building has both uh, aluminum framing around the windows. Note the blue-green Solex, right? So again, using heat absorbing uh, glazing, insulated glazing to uh, improve the environmental performance of glass. Um, that uh, aluminum uh, framing, the sort of curved frame around the, the windows is there so that the windows can rotate uh, in and out for cleaning. So they don't need scaffolding or, or repellers on the outside to, to wash the windows. But look between the windows, right? All of the rest of the, the building is stamped uh, aluminum sheeting. Uh, it has this kind of inverted pyramid in the sill panels that gives it some stiffness that prevents it from what we call oil canning, uh, subtle um, uh, curves or bending in the, in the panel that can reflect light in weird ways that make it seem kind of flimsy, um, and aluminum column covers as well. So Alcoa, by using its product so extensively uh, on the building, is really making the argument that they produce a metal that is very versatile when it comes to building facades. Um, here in some of the details, you can see that, again, they have uh, fireproof sill walls, right, of uh, perlite, which is lightweight uh, concrete. Um, but then on the outside of that, you have a slotted connection that takes you to these, um, uh, the, 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 the sort of stamped uh, solid panels. And then between the solid panels, again, um, supported on the, the perlite uh, backup walls, you get the aluminum framed plate glass window that you see in the upper right. And notice there's heat resistant plate glass on the outside and clear plate glass on the inside of the, of the insulated unit. So not only preventing cold weather from infiltrating through radiant heat, but also preventing uh, glare and preventing the solar gain that you would get uh, in summer. That creates a, a, a full system, right? Alcoa is basically arguing with this building uh, that its material can, can take over from steel and can do everything essentially from the slab on out, that the curtain wall can be a, a sort of packaged unit and that you can take advantage of all of these potential uh, cost savings and time savings by thinking about the, the, the building cladding, not again as a series of parts, but as integrated units. And as you can see from the, the fabrication process on the left, the construction process on the right, this puts all of the really kind of fussy labor into the factory. Uh, it allows all of that to happen while the building foundations are being poured, while the building structure is going up. And then on the right, you see it only takes a relatively small crew to hoist these panels into place. And you can see the angles uh, on, the, on the slab that are going to support the cladding units, but also at the same time allow for the adjustment uh, that they'll need to be in exactly the right place. Um, Alcoa is a, a building that, um, that really kind of sets the tone that um, after about 1953-54, uh, what you find is that aluminum really has a role to play in building cladding of, of all sorts. And that initial kind of generation of steel curtain walls comes to be seen as just a little bit kind of clunky, that, that steel doesn't allow for the finesse that you need uh, to get the real, real precision uh, that aluminum allows and that people soon get very, very used to, architects, clients uh, alike. You start to see uh, others using aluminum uh, in, in different ways. So here, uh, Gordon Bunshaft and SOM, same firm that did the Pepsi-Cola building, uh, down a little bit further in Manhattan, this is a, a branch of the manufacturer's Hanover Trust, where they have about 30 foot high uh, windows on the, the ground and banking floor. And they frame these in very, very large, about eight inch deep uh, aluminum mullions, right? Typical aluminum mullions uh, that would, would seem very, very familiar today. Um, the aluminum is strong enough to support 
the wind loads on that 30-foot uh, uh, vertical span. And you can see that they integrate seamlessly with the more traditional curtain wall above. All of it hung off of the, the, the building structure, the, the steel and concrete uh, floor plate that, that, uh, that runs behind them. And this, this is sort of the beginning of a generation of very fairly simply framed but elegantly framed uh, glass walls that um, come to you know, populate the, the nation's cities, right? become the ubiquitous uh, sort of glass box. Glass boxes are uh, only uh, made more popular by further improvements uh, in glass and in curtain wall technology. Um, in particular, uh, in 1957, Pilkington, the same glass company that uh, created the twin grinding process that saved the expense and time of manually or machine polishing uh, both sides of the glass but having to manually move the, the glass around, uh, Pilkington comes up with this uh, even greater improvement in 1957. It doesn't reach the market for another 10 years or so, um, but when it does, it makes glass by far the least expensive way to clad uh, high-rise buildings. Um, float glass is essentially uh, taking all of the, the glass process, the, um, the, the, the melting, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the creating the plates or creating the sheets, grinding and polishing and puts it all into the, the oven itself. Um, the way it does this is that it, it uh, pulls the molten glass sheet out onto not a, a casting table, but onto a bath of molten tin, which has a very, very high surface tension. And as the glass uh, floats on top of the melted tin, uh, it both evens out in thickness and ends up with this almost perfectly uh, transparent, perfectly smooth finish because the surface of the tin uh, is so, uh, so smooth itself. Um, the glass is gradually cooled. Uh, it's annealed so that it, uh, it, it doesn't uh, distort and give you kind of weird uh, reflections and refractions. Uh, and then finally it's cut. And as you can see, there are, are no mechanical processes in this. This is all about uh, the temperature of the furnace, the bed of the furnace, uh, and at the end of the process is the first time that, that a machine actually touches the glass, right, when it's actually cut. So over this, as you can see, amazing 600 meter uh, production process, you put raw materials in at the end, you get out a perfect product uh, at the other end. And float glass uh, creates implosive pricing, right, glass gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and very quickly you find architects and builders taking advantage of this. Uh, using glass in um, what are often called slick skin buildings uh, where the glass just kind of takes over. This is also in an era where the spandrel wall has disappeared from fire codes in, in big cities throughout the country. And so you can get these floor to floor uh, glass panels. Um, this is maybe the most famous but also the most notorious of the slick skin buildings, one of the earliest uh, buildings to take advantage of, of float glass. Uh, I am Pays John Hancock Tower uh, in Boston. And you can see in the detail on the right that it has, uh, there are steel angles at the top that go to the slab and allow for the kind of movement uh, to adjust to get the, the alignment perfectly right. Uh, the dark hatching is an aluminum mullion uh, and you can see that it is uh, split so that you're getting a little bit of, uh, of insulating value. Um, there are, this is through the spandrel panels, so there are solid uh, elements behind it. Note that those solid elements are insulation though, not uh, concrete. So this is covering the edge of the slab. It's not doing any uh, fireproofing and it's adding as much insulating value as we can get uh, to, the, to the building skin. And then on the very exterior, you can see that there is single sheet float glass uh, that is literally adhered to the mullion, right? It's literally glued on uh, to the mullion. There's no mechanical connection. And therefore you get this very, very slick, very, very minimal detail where the glass meets the, the aluminum, right? Meets its, its structure. Um, shortly after it opened, <laughs> the glass on this building started coming off. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for this. Uh, some of it uh, was thought to have to do with the building distorting. It's a very thin floor plate. And so there were concerns that as the building racked even slightly in the wind, it was dislodging or, or tearing the adhesive uh, off of the glass. 
more likely uh, the, the problem had to do with the glass itself and um, what are called nickel sulfide inclusions in the glass that caused it to spontaneously break uh, because, of, because of heat gain. Um, whatever the, the case was decided in court, the, um, the outcome uh, was kept confidential, but the building had to be largely reclad, uh, and it uh, offered both a, a kind of glimpse of what was possible with the newly affordable glass, uh, but also how to be the, the, how uh, necessary it was to be particularly careful uh, about details like the one we see on the right, um, to, to not rely maybe on a single line of adhesive to hold the glass in place, but to do something uh, a little more robust. And just to finish with kind of the ultimate uh, curtain wall, um, float glass uh, is so popular and so cheap that by 1972, uh, a young firm uh, by the name of Norman Foster Associates uh, decides to see if they can work with Pilkington to clad a, a short building that they have, a, an insurance uh, headquarters in the town of Ipswich, to see if they can clad that building entirely in glass with no aluminum, uh, no mullions whatsoever. It's a little bit of a crazy idea, right? There's no real reason to do it other than wanting to have the very, very slick, uh, very, very minimal facade uh, that, that would respond to the unusual shape of the building. It's sort of an amoeba shape that's defined by a, a handful of streets that wander uh, around it. And what Foster and Pilkington develop is a system called structural glazing, where the glass is actually held in tension from the top slab and is connected to that slab and to the elements both above and below it uh, by a series of steel connections, right? which today we call spider connections. As you'll see, the ones here uh, are a little cruder than the ones we use today, but the, the principle is that you're basically hanging literally a curtain of glass. And each one of the vertical columns of glass is literally a column. It's just in tension instead of in compression. Uh, glass can be nearly as strong as steel if you treat it well. Uh, don't subject it to bending or shear. And so in pure uh, compression or pure tension, sorry, um, glass can hold its own weight easily uh, over two or three stories. You can see on the left that this is literally a glass curtain. So there you can see the slab coming right out to the glass. There is a, a little bit of a fitting uh, on the very edge uh, that supports a, a glass downstand. The fin on the back is taking what little wind load there is from story to story you know, back into the, the slab above. And then down below it, it's just literally the hanging glass. The patch plates that you see at the intersection of the glass and the slab or the glass and the fin uh, are made of steel. They have neoprene in them to take up some of the local movements of the glasses and subjected to, uh, to local stresses. But all of this means that the, the glass is acting structurally uh, and it's doing all the work, not only of enclosing the building, but also supporting its own weight, right? Taking its own weight uh, up, to the, up to the slab above. And I want to argue that with Willis Faber, even though it's only three stories, um, we've kind of come full circle, right? That this is really the achievement of that by Hane Nicht, the, the almost nothing uh, dream that Mies had of cladding his skyscrapers in uh, a skin of nothing more than this transparent material that he argued would uh, disappear at the edges and create these reflections and shadows in the middle that would really dematerialize the, the building. And I think with, with Willis Faber and with subsequent uh, structural glazing uh, installations, uh, that's literally what you get, right? It's not exactly the, the, the complete minimalism that Mies had expected, right? Mies doesn't show any furniture, or any walls, or uh, any drop ceilings and ductwork in, in his glass skyscraper. Um, or a real building, of course, in 1972 needs all those things. Um, but it does show that the, the urge toward uh, this very, very minimal, very transparent, very ephemeral solution to building skins is one that sticks with architects, in this case for something like 50 years. Uh, and even today, that urge to clad our buildings in a skin that disappears is kind of still with us. We look at Willis Faber, for example, and think immediately of solar gain and the environmental issues uh, that, that, that we would have with it in today's world. But that idea of pushing the technology uh, until it almost disappears is one that, that sort of follows the curtain wall as it develops, uh, at least through the 1970s uh, and 1980s. 
We'll switch gears in the next couple of lectures. We'll talk more about uh, the structure of buildings, both long spans, looking at uh, concrete in shell form, uh, and also at high rises, looking at what steel and concrete can do uh, inside a building uh, to extend the heights of them even further than we've seen uh, going into the 1920s and 1930s.